I'm super glad to see you. Oh, I'm glad to see you too. It's been a long time. It has been a very long time. A very long time. <laughs> I am um, so long, in fact, I kind of forgot what day it is. Yeah. Can you tell me? Do you remind me? It's Youth Poetry Finals Night. What? It's Youth Poetry Finals Night, Gina. What? Oh my gosh. It is the 2021 LTAB Youth Poetry finals night y'all let's go that's right we are so excited to have you all joining us virtually uh we're thrilled truly this is a once in a lifetime it is kind of extravaganza um i'm here tonight with my good friend and co-worker our communications director at the nwc celine haynes and if you want to tell celine haynes that she is awesome and is wearing a great shirt you can use she her pronouns all right, y'all, yes, and this is our program director, my good Juju, Gina. And if you want to talk to her, you can use she, her, her pronouns. Amazing. Well, we want to welcome you all officially to the 2021 Video and Anthology Finals Night. We are crowning youth poets, Woo. celebrating their talents. There's going to be trophies. Trophies. There's going to be Pop-Tarts. Lots of Pop-Tarts. So many Pop-Tarts. There's going to be music music some dancing if we bring it and if you bring it in your kitchens in your living rooms wherever you are from the safety of your couches um we are pumped we are ready for some youth poets yes we are and let's not forget there's also going to be money involved for some of our winners so let's see who cashes out <laughs> mm, i love that joining us for the first time and don't know who we are, we are representatives of the Nebraska Writers Collective, which is a nonprofit based in Omaha that does poetry programming really across the state and a little bit into the westernmost slice of Iowa, Council Bluffs. Um, so we've got poetry programs as far west as Ogallala, Nebraska, North Platte, um, lots of schools in OPS, LPS, uh, and really our mission is just to bring community together. Um, to form community, yep. to use poetry to facilitate connections, mm -hmm. um, and make friendships. Uh, kind of like the one that Selene and I have. Aww. So, in all seriousness, um, Selene and I are very lucky to be sharing space together today, and we want to be clear about that. Uh, we have both been lucky enough to receive uh, the vaccine, so we have had both of our doses, um, and we are following CDC guidelines, which now say that we can gather um, because we are vaccinated together. Not in big crowds, though, which is why <laughs> you all are watching from the comfort of your homes. Um, so if you are out and about, if you are with people who have not been vaccinated, even if you have, please still remember to mask. Wear your mask. Wear your mask, keep each other safe. Um, and we are very much looking forward to spring 2022 when hopefully we can be uh, yelling into microphones uh, across the city okay. together again and high-fiving people and, and eating with one another and you know doing all the joyful poetry community things that all we do each spring. Yeah. Yes, I know. I'm I'm very thankful to be able to be here with Gina, like Gina has said, but it does make me a little bit sad that we can't be in person, but also I'm happy that we're able to bring all of this joy and energy to you all, like she said, from the comfort of your homes. Um, with that being said, I just want to just give a warm, a big, big warm thank you to everyone who has made this possible. It's not just us, obviously. <laughs> we couldn't do this alone. So we just want to say, first of all, thank you to our teacher sponsors. Um, we appreciate you guiding your students along the way. Thank you to all our um, TAs and our coaches. You're amazing. And we're just very grateful and 
we gotta thank the poets yes. come on thank you poets for doing y'all job for bringing the art to the camera absolutely and the book and the page yeah so thank you <laughs> we love that we are still in a pandemic and the poetry just hasn't stopped nope never will don't stop <laughs> so thank y'all let's get into the show listen we get it it is absolutely absurd that we think we're gonna pick winners mm. poets who have won something like first place right Seek. i just it's like walking into the jocelyn art museum seeing <laughs> a beautiful painting mm -hmm. and saying 8.5 right like it's not it's not a thing you know um so we want to recognize that there is a kind of you know ridiculousness to this yeah. a kind of silliness and absurdity um Poetry is for everybody all the time. Um, and so if you enter these contests and you call yourself a writer, then it is so. You are a writer, you are a poet, um, you have already won. You've already done the hard work of creating a thing, putting it out into the world and showing it to somebody. And the titles, they come and they go, you know? Do you think the best poet always wins the slam? <laughs> Remember, remember what we always say in Louder Than a Bomb, the points are not the point. The point is the poetry. poetry. That's right. So, we are starting off the night with the winners of the Viewer's Choice prizes. Um, these prizes are brought to us by all of you who took the time to vote and chime in and say which poets were your favorite in the following six categories. Yes. So we had best humor poem, most likely to change the world, best quarantine poem, best identity poem, best writing, and to top it all off, best performance. So let's go ahead and see who those winners are. My name is Delaney and this is Whoever You Are, I Love You. Can I ask you a question? Maybe it's not cut and dry. Maybe it's about you and I. Maybe an answer you could supply because I truly want to know. I shouldn't beat around the bush and I really don't want to push, but I guess what I want to ask is coffee or tea? If we woke up with a view, would it be mountains or the sea? Do you always brush your teeth in the morning and would you help remind me? Does your aesthetic fit punk or cottage core vibes? Do you like shopping at Goodwill? Would you ever wear a tie? Would you pull your mask down to make faces at me, and would you help me overthrow the bourgeoisie? Would you get fancy for no reason and do things wildly inappropriate for that attire, like eat greasy fast food, change a stranger's flat tire? When you write, are your letters all pretty and neat, or are they loopy and sloppy with sentences incomplete? Do you prefer pencil or pen? Do you use the eraser? Do you cross out with scribbles or think about what you say first? Do you ever mix up letters, G's and J's, P's and D's? Do you ever write poetry? Would you read some to me? Would you rename me, sweetheart? Watch how I react. How do you make me check the time during things I couldn't wait to be at? How can you make a hug a lifetime, mold something you've never touched? Would you free my mind from confines, but look at me without disgust? If I gave you my word, would you simply discard it? Would you welcome my well-worn wish to be wanted? Because if I made a deal with the devil and you were my due, I would sell my soul. How could I ever pay in full? Let me drown in the debt of you. What if I wanted you, all strings attached? Would you make me your marionette? Would you let me be your rise? your fall, your shift, your impact, because I don't think that I love you, I know it for a fact, and if we went on a win, would you ever take it back? Would you let me hold on with every ounce of my strength, understand that I love you, I'm not just saving face, because if you shattered on impact and fractured in two, could I pick up your pieces, could I be your glue, and with all of these choices, would you let me love you, and in writing this poem, somehow I push you away? Claim to ask all my questions, kept my real thoughts at bay, but I know someone's parking place. I know his favorite color. I know he likes ice cream over cake. I have heard his late night stutter. I know your first instrument wasn't the guitar. I know you aren't going to college. I know your parents think you are. 
I think I know your face. I think I've seen your smile. I think I have known I love you for a while. And I know your middle name. I have seen your favorite clothes. I know what makes you feel ashamed. I know things I will never disclose. One last question. Would you tell me if I'm right? Do I know who you are? Because I think that I might. Thank you for listening to my final inquiry. Whoever you are, whoever you may be, I love you. I love you. Hello, my name is Jules Wiestwald. I'm a sophomore at Westside High School. And um, because I feel like we need this right now, I wrote a poem about the last, the first hug that I had had in a while. The hug. I hadn't seen him in a month and a half. COVID hit him pretty hard. And out of safety, he stayed away from me for a month and a half. But that day, I ran into him in the library. The way his eyes widened and he slowly put down his phone, then gently reached up towards his earbud microphone where he said hastily, I'll talk to you later. I then took a seat, as close to him as I possibly could, considering the height of the seats. I was open for two mods. It was amazing. And in a strange way, very reassuring. Wanna brawl? He asked with a smirk, referring to our favorite Battle Royale-style mobile game. We jokingly interlocked our elbows and played with one hand because we held hands during most of the game modes, no question, and you didn't dare let go. Some people would consider the gestures of affection he displays, he displays to be insignificant because they are smaller things, like hand-holding or leaning against each other's forehead. But I know him well enough to know that he's more comfortable in private, and he's ace. So the acts of affection, to me anyway, tend to feel more endearing, because they're very specific. The entire experience was as if we hadn't even been apart, but there was one moment that sold it to me, that reassured me it's just the circumstances that are keeping us apart, not the relationship. The way he hugged me goodbye. I was open 12th and 13th mod, but not 14th. We had this hilarious, he had this ex hilarious external battle with himself about walking me down to Latin because he didn't want to get up, but still wanting to stay with me. Anyway, he just decided to stay in the library. I grabbed my backpack and turned to hug him. It was a long hug, a comfortable hug, a hug with depth. Just the way his arms wrapped around me said, I missed hugging you like this. And then he gently ran his hand along the back of my head and pulled me a little closer, as he did the first time we hugged like that, back a few months ago, which brought me back to Halloween night when I told him about how I loved the way he hugged me and that it just made me think, I want to feel that again. He remembered, but not on purpose. This hug was yet detailed, very natural in his execution. We said goodbye and I started walking away. I'll keep you safe by sleeping at last started playing in my headphones. What a perfect song for this moment, I thought. I walked down to Latin with a hidden smile under my mask. Thank you. I'm Stephanie and this is Coyote. A red and white gas station, a full moon, 1.27 a.m., the sound of a steel guitar floats out from his stereo. The only other person in the lot at his own identical pillar is taller than me. His sluggish movements jar against my coffee jitters, and yet something about us is the same. I almost forgot that I'm in Texas. For a moment I was back in Nebraska between cornfields and cow pastures, not sagebrush and cattle. Something about the colors of come and go and Texaco has blurred the line between the two. I do not know which I prefer, home or this land of foreign weather. My bones rest easy in Midwest breezes, but long for something warmer. It is warmer here. It's a strange thing to long for a place I've never lived in, for a home that's never been mine, to hallucinate the howls of coyotes chasing the horizon, to dream so vividly of cacti pricking my fingers that I wake up tasting blood, to look at a place where the air hangs heavy and listen to the dirt scream of a story that I don't know the ending to. Texas is not my home, but does that even matter? 
Because when I fantasize about what life would be like down here, I see so much space that I could take two steps and get lost in all of it. I see branded leather and scorched earth, harsh dark greens and wide open blues. I see the sun on that place where cowboys told stories of how far the sky stretched and of the spirits that roamed the surface, the place where my grandfather died, where I loved and couldn't bear to let go. Could I ever truly belong to this place? This place which calls in the depths of my soul, shakes my very being, does it want me? Or will I always be foreign here? I lock eyes with the man now mirroring my position. We are opposites here in the night. Backs on cool aluminum, toes tapping impatiently, the gallon counters click in rhythmic harmony. In a wordless gaze, I know he longs for the same thing. Not quite Nebraska, not quite Texas, but something in his eyes says Maine, maybe Montana. They leap with ocean waves and stallion manes, and for a moment my heart does too. Maybe we are not opposites. Maybe we are exactly the same. Caught in between places, belonging to more than one home, and one could never feel right without the other. My name is Sarah, and this is my poem, To Whom It May Concern. From an individual who can no longer tolerate your actions, you are responsible for everything that comes out of your mouth, and if you aren't careful, you'll be responsible for the vomit coming out of mine. I hope that disgusts you the way you disgust me every time you say something that invades the comfort of those around you. I have heard your apologies. Your, I'm sorry you feel that way, is just mean you're sorry your actions actually had consequences. Your clueless behavior speaks to your ignorance, not your innocence. My reaction speaks to my instincts, not my level of tolerance. I should not have to field questions about the size of my chest, or listen to comments related to the modesty of what I wear, or even have to tell you this because you should know not to ask me about my body. You don't get to decide if what I wear is decent just because you claim to uphold ideals of righteousness throwing your unsolicited praise on those around you for doing what you deem to be correct. Save your unspoken, not all men. I have heard it lying under every sentence. I don't care if you don't understand anymore. Why should I be the one who is understanding or apologetic? To the men who think it's okay to give compliments about modest clothing or ask about our bodies. We didn't ask you. I didn't ask you. You aren't helping me. Stop telling me you are. You aren't being kind to me. Stop believing that you are. You make women suspicious. You twist insults into what you think is kindness. You continue to convince yourself of your perfection as you, you. It has to be about you, even as I feel myself fade into the background. I want to tell you to respect others. You're rather good at respecting the image of yourself. Respect me. Don't tell me you respect me, prove it. If you want my appreciation, educate yourself. Learn how to talk to a woman. Learn how to represent yourself as a man. To the girl who thinks no one will believe her because he only said something, I see you. To the girl who thinks if she wasn't physically assaulted, then she's not a real victim, I understand you. To men. All men, there are boundaries that are unacceptable to cross. They occur long before you reach out to touch someone who doesn't want to feel your hand. To not all men, your work is unfinished. Join us, help us eradicate the injustice that so many fall victim to. Silence the disrespectful comments. Don't stand in front of me and proclaim how good of a man you are. Stand with me and show me, show everyone. I want to live in a world where I don't feel like I have to pull my jacket tighter around me or wear winter clothes in the pleasant breezes of late spring. My fear of others has become a fear of being myself. I don't want to be afraid anymore, but I forgot how to be brave. So at least today, you don't matter anymore. At least today, I am free of what you think, free of your questions, your comments, your concerns about my body that you don't deserve to voice, to whom it may concern, or to whom it doesn't concern because my body and my spirit belong to me. Hi, my name is 
is Sophia. I'm a junior in Omaha Central, and my poem is called The Day is March 13th. My aunt turns on the radio. I am lying in the cold sheets of the hotel bedroom, listening to the voices of early morning NPR, my body heavy and my head light from a lack of sleep, bits and pieces of radio dialogues from the car ride here floating around in my head, ecstatic. We check out of the hotel and step into the void of 5 a.m. rural Nebraska. The sun's light is just high enough to grab the horizon and bleed into it. Clouds dim over the sky, the horizon peeking out from the edge, a streak of red in the middle of shadows and silhouettes. Probably where demons go and smoke cigarettes after the end of a long night, before they descend down below, raking their claws on the clouds as they go. We drive past corn mills and concrete bridges, cloaked in shadows and faint orange lights. The one gas station we stop at seeming to be the only source of life. An empty middle ground seemingly devoid of earth and space. The car radio is silent. It's all tires running on empty roads and the swish of bare trees and cornfields. My gaze keeps returning to the red streak that separates barren land and sky so it doesn't all bleed together into one big shadow. I watch as more light slowly starts to seep into the cigarette smoke clouded at the horizon. As we pass over a bridge running across a creek, the faintest shade of blue tinting the road ahead. And the car stops. The world goes silent as my aunt rolls down the windows. The morning chill hits my skin. Demons stop smoking. A faint chatter is carried over on the wind, slowly growing. As we drive to the other side of the bridge, the trees part, and we see the river running into the edge of the world. The smoke is gone and blue clouds replace it. I begin to see the gentle bumps and folds in the sky as I stand at the river bank. The streak of red heals into a mellow pink, gently touching the river below. We stand there and watch as the chiming of cranes grow louder, pushing the bleeding claws down further and bringing up the sun, letting it sink into the clouds and the river and the tops of bare trees, the warm light brushing the undersides of the cranes as they fly above, fly to the river of pink and orange that lies across the horizon and settle into the waters of reflected light below. A symphony of cranes directed by the breeze, backed with the waters gently lapping at the docks behind us. The world is painted in shades of gold and blue as we turn our backs. And I sit with my head pressed against the car window to get one last glance of the river. My aunt turns on the radio, static voices buzzing through, their statements saying nothing but saying everything reminding me that this might be the last time I get to go out for a while. I wonder if God lives in a small house, not confining but comfortable, if mementos from the years long gone litter the small walkways and family pictures decorate the living room. If the fridge is covered in our proudest artwork. I wonder if God's room is a garden or a library or a studio. If stuffed animals, childhood friends, and beautiful memories are scattered about. And boy, she loves her stuffed animals. I wonder if God is a passionate, quirky artist with thoughts scattered like stars and enthusiasm being everything in between. If her creativity is as abundant as antimatter. I wonder if God has frizzy hair and loves to wear sundresses and go on adventures. If God wants to cut her hair in a whirlwind of rebellion, only to grow it out again and cut it short once more. If to her, it was an act of liberation. God probably wondered if her creativity was a blessing as much as it was a curse. If her loneliness was the same way, perhaps that is why she gravitated towards art. Maybe she constructed our world long ago with ineffable language or with indescribable acts of beauty or with art, but the earth itself couldn't cure her isolation, so in haste she made Adam. She had wanted diversity anyways. But after a while, he got kind of boring. So she conceived of someone more like her, 
a chaotic beauty who possessed her ability to bring life. I think in her quest for creation, she made evil too. God understood that a world could not exist without balance, and while she didn't want her small creations to experience true wickedness, shame, and imperfections, it remained. The poor people had learned of pain from the apple tree. Their defiance and newfound suffering threw her into a frenzy of wrath, something she had not experienced before. Maybe it was because she hadn't loved so much and been disappointed. It took a while for her to truly forgive, and God matured as her human beings began to understand more of the world she created for them. She began to guide more than punish, and as ashamed as she was about her anger, God was willing to reconcile. So she conceived of a son who loved her creation as much as she did. She didn't want him to suffer in love's name, but he did anyways. She never forgot. She once again spectated as her creations exposed the best and worst parts of her. She didn't know whether to love or hate it, but she watched anyways. Okay, so picture this. Mm -hmm. uh, many, many, many years ago, uh, Celine and I were youth poets competing on stages across the city of Omaha. Celine went to Central and I went to Omaha Duchenne. Um, and so something that happens in uh, standard LTAP years, we'll call them. Yeah, yeah. The crowd gets really excited and each school Ooh. has a kind of cheer that the crowd can say back to students who are performing. Um, so they'll introduce themselves on stage and then have this great affirmation of folks cheering them on. Uh, so, Celine, what was your cheer for oh, Central? Oh, oh, you're trying to call it out of me. Okay, 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 okay. So, it was something like this. Kaka, kaka. Ha ha! That was really? good. That was good. That was a really good reenactment. Yeah. Thank you. That felt dusted off my shoulders. Mm -hmm. What about you, Dina? So at Duchenne, um, we just use the power of silence. Uh, so everybody else would, would cheer um, and have chants, and then we would go up on stage and just freak people out by being completely <laughs> silent. And um, yeah, I don't know. We thought that was gonna trip up the competition. Y'all had to say, it, it's not about the chant. Our poetry is about to do the job. Like, y'all just knew y'all stuff was good. Pay attention, listen mm -hmm. to the words, right? Yay. Yeah. yeah, no distractions. So hopefully y'all at home come up with some little chance or something. You know, this is your moment to say a little shout out. Mm -hmm. Let's go. The times when students are typically most nervous, uh, when they're about to go up and perform group poems. So Ooh. they have to have this piece either memorized or ready to perform in sync. Uh, it's kind of like a choir, but of four <laughs> poets <laughs> speaking choir. together. Uh, so, let's welcome up the winners of our group piece competition for this year. I'm Delaney. I'm Stephanie. I'm Rachel. I'm Sarah. And this is Never Quite Ready. You, you won't, won't always be, be here. here. I know that. I wish I could change. The fact of the matter. But you and I both know that time cannot stop. It's memories. memories. Every second that ticks by is a memory taken and placed in the recesses of my, my mind. My mind is never quite ready to let you go. I linger in hugs. Pull the scent from your sweater. Say, say I, I love, love you more, more times than, than I can count. You taught me how to take pictures. Hands steady, check the lighting, breathe in. One, two, three. Capture, Capture the moments, the memories, and everything in between. The, the time, time is never long enough. enough. It slips through fingers, escapes from grasp. It, it won't stay still. There's, There's never, never enough time. time. Time is the enemy. Time is what will take you away from me. Stop it. Stop, Stop it, it now. now. I'm not ready to let you go. There's never enough time. Only 13 years. 40 years. 60. 80 isn't enough. Three words are not enough to tell you how much I love you, to tell you how much it would hurt to lose you, how when I thought you were gone, my, my heart, heart wrenched itself from my body. body. My, my lungs, lungs forgot how to breathe. breathe. Feet frozen to the floor in a moment of complete terror. A moment. A memory. A, memory. a singular thought of, of you. you. If I held you right here in my arms, in my heart. If I took in the height difference that is no longer there, took in the moment like it's the last one we'd share, would I laugh or would I cry? Would I get in my head or try to get in yours? Will you miss me as much as I will miss you when it's over, when you're gone and I'm left alone?
Hey Ava, I'm Charlie Curtis Beard. I was one of the judges for the creative video contest of LTAB and I'm here to talk to you today because we decided to choose you as the winner. Yay! So first of all, congratulations. As a former LTAB student myself, it's always great to come back and see the students still doing the thing. I am just completely floored by your talent and your ability to create at such a young age. Ultimately, the deciding factor was kind of the fact that your video concept was so strong. Having a clear, concise concept throughout the whole video to keep us entertained and invested throughout the whole thing. Smart. Using this video to showcase your drawing skills as well. Smart. Piecing yourself together to reveal at the end that she is me. Very, 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 very smart. Not only was the video concept really good, but your writing just blew me away. This line right here. I am not this girl made of fresh fallen snow and raw honeycomb hexagons, amber hair streaked with the sun, eyes as bright as her mind and a touch as gentle as flowing waves. She always knows what to say. <sighs> like, like what? <laughs> like, how are you writing like this in high school? This is incredible. Honestly, the writing and the video concept together just showcased so much talent, so much creativity, and it was just felt like an actual polished poetry video that you'd see like on a big YouTube channel or something like that. So ultimately, I hope you enjoy this big old fat W right here. Um, congrats again. You very much so deserve it. is she? I know I'm not a girl made of roaring fire and glowing silver moonlight. The kind of girl people fall for at a glance. The girl who isn't afraid to ask for what she wants. I don't know what I want. I was not born as this perfectly polished ruby in a family of raw gemstones, never worrying about who I need to be, just able to be. I am not this girl made of fresh fallen snow and raw honeycomb hexagons, amber hair streaked with the sun, eyes as bright as her mind and a touch as gentle as flowing waves. She always knows what to say. I am always too soft or too harsh. My sharpness is a refreshing blast of cold air or a day that doesn't blow wind through sails. She is always so eloquent. She says what's on her mind and it sounds like music. I don't know how to say what I mean. I can't put my thoughts into words, so I don't say anything. She has the ideal body, but she doesn't care what people think of her. I respect her for that, but I care too much. I never seem good enough, even though people say I am. I don't feel at home in my body. This body wasn't meant for me. She is somehow beauty personified, an Aphrodite to everyone else, and I am somehow Persephone, or maybe Hephaestus. I keep myself a secret. I don't tell them that I went willingly to the underworld, to my mind where no light shines. I can't survive there, but I went anyway because my curiosity has always seemed to destroy me. Oh, to be that girl, the girl everyone sees when they look at me, that girl of ice-cold lake water and star-kissed skin, the blast of cold that keeps you awake when she speaks, and the warm breeze that puts you to sleep under a willow tree when she sings, my voice might keep you awake, but out of grinding annoyance, not beauty, they tell me I talk too much. I want to learn how to sing, how to put what I think into notes on a page. I want to learn to make people feel something. This girl is all the cliches about diamonds and emeralds. A diamond in the rough, her crystals are her mind and heart, her kindness and love. I think of myself as more of a rock. A pebble on the beach, looked at then thrown away. A stone in the road, people kick as they walk. Then I'm kicked away. I find it hard to say good things about myself. I'm a person of rain and tears, a person of sharp edges and fear, trust issues and pessimism, a blade of bitterness and perfectly kept up lies. I'm not a girl of fire and moonlight. I'm just this girl I pretend to be. If she's the sunrise, I'm a cloudy sky on some random Wednesday night. A little disappointing, but not important enough to remember. She
She is a girl of warmth and peace, honey and sugar and chamomile tea. She's the rainbow in the window pane, the flicker of the fireplace dancing across my face. She brings happiness like showers bring wildflowers in May. I wish I was like her, but maybe I don't. I guess I wish I was a person that someone would write this poem about how my awkwardness is appealing and cute and how I am perfectly imperfect. She is perfect. She is me. I'm Matt Mason. I am the Nebraska State Poet, as well as the Executive Director for the Nebraska Writers Collective. And I'm also the final judge for this year's anthology contest, which we're going to announce our top five. So with uh, a lot of help from uh, the first round judges, Colleen O'Doherty, Eric Morris, and Tracy Pittman, thank you all, uh, we selected 21 poems for this year's anthology and five of them will be getting special prizes with trophies, plaques, money, things like that. Um, but the points are not the points. The point is the fact that we had more entries than we've ever had before for uh, the anthology, and they were wonderful. It was hard to select a top five. Um, if I were to judge again, I might choose different five. Who knows? Um, but uh, I, I should say, too, that when you enter contests, it's up to a lot with what the judge's uh, feeling is, how their breakfast was when they read your poem, things like that. Um, because the three first round readers would have judged completely differently than I did. But we had a few things in common, but ultimately there were so many great poems that we're just so excited to read them. So let me go through the list. The fifth place winner is a poem called Wet Chalk by Ashley Nab of Lincoln East High School. Congratulations. A few of my favorite lines from this poem, our forts protected us from the truths of our situations. Our pretend games played out like premonitions of hardships we didn't know we had. We were drawn to stories of survival while our parents were quietly surviving. Fantastic poem. I loved reading this poem. Um, in fourth place, The Valley, The Validation by Alora Schneider, also of Lincoln East High School. Good job, Lincoln East. Um, uh, the, my favorite lines from this poem, maybe we don't need another poem about personal experiences, but maybe not every poem has to have a point. Or maybe writing poems about poems about poems drains you. A garbage disposal of thoughts until they are all just the same low drone. Maybe it has been raining and cold for a very long time. Maybe there is little to be said for the collective. Poems about pain are simply surgical. There is little beauty in the bleak, but I hold one thing to be true. There is hope in the small things. I just thought this was a fun look at writing and creativity. Um, congratulations, Alora. Uh, in third place, uh, a fantastic poem called Kitchen Dialogue. Um, this was by Jingming Yu. This was a wonderful poem. Um, my favorite lines from this. My sister told me that when our grandfather died, no, no one was there to cry at his funeral. My mother was boiling cabbage soup, my grandmother was pickling white radish and cucumbers, and my aunt was baking red bean pastries in her kitchen. I just love the details and how they draw you in. That's the opening of the poem, and it draws you in and keeps you with it through the whole thing. So thank you so much for submitting this poem, and I enjoyed reading it, and we're going to love publishing this uh, in the anthology this year. Um, two places left. I want to mention, though, that the anthology has appeared for the last few years with help uh, from the Somer family. Um, 
from Kate Somer was a, a, w one of our sponsors at Duchenne Academy uh, back when we started Louder Than a Bomb. And she passed away recently, but her family has helped us keep doing the anthology. So thank you so much. Thank you also to Sparkwheel Press, who really puts this together and gets it published. Uh, Liz Kay is the editor at Sparkwheel, and we are so grateful for your help. We also want to thank uh, the Jocelyn Art Museum's Kent Bellows Mentoring uh, Partnership, our program, which uh, provides uh, artwork, which we've had in our anthologies the last several years. So thank you so much, Kent Bellows, um, and all the student uh, artists there at Kent Bellows. So second place. We have a poem called, I Want to Be One of the Greats by Ev Parks of Omaha North High School. Um, my favorite lines from this, I want to be one of the greats, but I don't think the greats build their poems out of dust bunnies and trash. Love it. It's a poem about wanting to be great, but just not knowing if you are or will ever be. But it's a poem about finding greatness and you are in high school. So... You're only a few steps down the road, and it's tough from where you're at to see. You know, you can still see the whole road up the mountain, but you're on a good path so far. So, uh, fantastic job, Ev. And with one, one more poem to announce, but so many other great poems, this anthology will be out by the end of the summer. Um, and you can find it at the Bookworm Bookstore, um, as well as contact the Nebraska Writers Collective. We'll get you uh, copies, $10 each. Wow, what a bargain. Um, so, the first place uh, choice, this poem's called Secret to Happiness by Madeline Grives of Lincoln High School. My favorite lines from this poem, I found the secret to happiness in the smallest of moments, hidden like seeds within an apple, a sunny day or unexpected smile, the raspberry filling folded into the pastry of life. So many great details, so many great specifics in this poem. You can taste the pastry, everything. So um, I, I love how the poem is a whole list of items. There's not just one secret to happiness. For everybody, there are, you know, multitudes. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Madeline. Thank you, everybody who sent in a poem. Everybody who wrote a poem with us this year, thank you. An award we give out every year is the Spirit of the Slam Award. This is an award for the student who exemplifies what we think of as the spirit of the poetry slam, the camaraderie, the dedication, the working with others, the working on your own craft, um, the positive attitudes. Uh, this is something we've given out for years. And this year, we're giving it out uh, for a student award, but also for a teacher award, something we should have done before. Um, but this year, we're grateful to our teachers for all the work you've put in to keep Louder Than a Bomb going, despite the fact that you're pretty busy and have a few things going on with a pandemic and all. So, um, so thank you. So the first award I will mention is that teacher award. The spirit of the slam for the teacher this year, 2021, goes to John Horton of Westside Middle School. Congratulations and thank you. Some notes about uh, Mr. Horton is that he consistently goes above and beyond to make sure the Westside Middle School space is safe and encouraging enough for all writers to share. He's cultivated a team that both cares for each other and pushes each other to be the best version of their poetic selves. He makes an amazing atmosphere. Thank you so much, John. Our student award, or student awards, because we had a tie. So this year, we'll go to two students. Um, everyone who wins this award will receive a $50 gift card to a local independent bookseller. <laughs> Yay. Um, the first winner for the students is Sarah Sewer of Lincoln Northeast. 
Um, Sarah comes to every practice, always brings friends, is constantly writing new works through tough times. She is an amazing and encouraging presence in the club every week, leading with her enthusiasm and encouraging all the poets in the group. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for your work. Um, thank you for helping others. Um, the other student winner um, is Eva Berkland from Papillion La Vista High School. Um, she fought for two years to get an LTAB team at Papillion La Vista, finally succeeding last year and COVID hit. Um, but her, her coach describes her as being so dedicated, so uh, eager for feedback, working even when she had to attend practices in the car while her parents were driving uh, with her phone. So um, her, her dedication to LTAB and the teen poets that take part is admirable and I'm sure we will see it continue. Um, her coach Tracy said, it breaks my heart that someone this dedicated didn't get to experience LTAB in all its glory, but it warms my heart to see that it didn't stop her one bit. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Those who won awards, those who didn't, those who were part of our year. We thank you. Before we get into introducing the winners of the main video competition, I want to just take a quick pause and give a big shout out and thank you to a couple folks out there, one of which is Reagan Myers. Thank you so much, Reagan, for all the time and effort and just the energy and love you put into making this project possible. If y'all don't know who Reagan Myers is, y'all got to go check her out. She is an amazing poet. Like amazing poet um if you look her up you'll find her and she actually was one of button poetry's best of 2017 with one of her poems that got over a million views a million views y'all y'all gotta go check out reagan i also wanted to give a special thank you to sam van cook who was one of our amazing judges we're just so thankful for all the time and energy you also put into this work and making it possible if you didn't know sam is the founder of button poetry which is one of the biggest poetry platforms in the world y'all the world so thank you Sam for all the time that you put into this and giving that love back to our youth poets we're so grateful to have had you and you're welcome back any anytime so thank you I also want to mention that as we find out who the winners of the main competition are this evening Sam wanted to leave a special gift to our poets this evening by just talking a little bit about the joys that he found in each poem. So that's going to be pretty amazing and I'm super excited to see all that he has to say. Let's get into it. Whoever you are, I love you, explores the intersections between knowing someone and loving them. The author navigates the excitement and uncertainty of love organically. As we move through the text, a literal narrative of love from afar begins to emerge. At the same time, we as the audience are invited to ask what is to be known and where the desire to be loved and the desire to love someone else begin and end. My name is Delaney and this is Whoever You Are, I Love You. Can I ask you a question? Maybe it's not cut and dry. Maybe it's about you and I. Maybe an answer you could supply because I truly want to know. I shouldn't beat around the bush and I really don't want to push, but I guess what I want to ask is coffee or tea? If we woke up with a view, would it be mountains or the sea? Do you always brush your teeth in the morning and would you help remind me? Does your aesthetic fit punk or cottage core vibes? Do you like shopping at Goodwill? Would you ever wear a tie? Would you pull your mask down to make faces at me and would you help me overthrow the bourgeoisie? 
Would you get fancy for no reason and do things wildly inappropriate for that attire, like eat greasy fast food, change a stranger's flat tire? When you write, are your letters all pretty and neat, or are they loopy and sloppy with sentences incomplete? Do you prefer pencil or pen? Do you re use the eraser? Do you cross out with scribbles or think about what you say first? Do you ever mix up letters, G's and J's, P's and D's? Do you ever write poetry? Would you read some to me? Would you rename me sweetheart? Watch how I react. How do you make me check the time during things I couldn't wait to be at? How can you make a hug a lifetime, mold something you've never touched? Would you free my mind from confines, but look at me without disgust? If I gave you my word, would you simply discard it? Would you welcome my well-worn wish to be wanted? Because if I made a deal with the devil and you were my due, I would sell my soul. How could I ever pay in full? Let me drown in the debt of you. What if I wanted you, all strings attached? Would you make me your marionette? Would you let me be your rise? your fall, your shift, your impact, because I don't think that I love you, I know it for a fact, and if we went on a win, would you ever take it back? Would you let me hold on with every ounce of my strength, understand that I love you, I'm not just saving face, because if you shattered on impact and fractured in two, could I pick up your pieces, could I be your glue, and with all of these choices, would you let me love you, and in writing this poem, somehow I push you away. Claim to ask all my questions, kept my real thoughts at bay, but I know someone's parking place. I know his favorite color. I know he likes ice cream over cake. I have heard his late night stutter. I know your first instrument wasn't the guitar. I know you aren't going to college. I know your parents think you are. I think I know your face. I think I've seen your smile. I think I have known I love you for a while. And I know your middle name. I have seen your favorite clothes. I know what makes you feel ashamed. I know things I will never disclose. One last question, would you tell me if I'm right? Do I know who you are? Because I think that I might. Thank you for listening to my final inquiry. Whoever you are, whoever you may be, I love you. I love you. In Kitchen Dialogue, the author draws the audience into the narrative with personal and well-crafted detail. Each new image sows the seeds of another question and leads us deeper into the mysteries of familial grief. We emerge with the author into a future self that is a metaphor for a new love language and for a new sense of family. My sister told me that when our grandfather died, no one was there to cry at his funeral. My mother was boiling cabbage soup, my grandmother was pickling white radish and cucumbers, and my aunt was baking red bean pastries in her kitchen. Because hearts do not speak in this home, because our families are trapped in a Pavlovian design of affection, because what poison memories left untreated renders us mute and desperately silent, we try to remedy the cycle of this condition with the same medicine. Your mother threatened suicide when you wanted to quit the violin, so she made you your favorite teriyaki chicken. Your father threw a book at your nose, so he treats the wound with ice cubes from the freezer. His father beat him with a soup spoon, so his mother bought him dumplings from the vendor across the street. My mother doesn't speak to me for a week, so she leaves a play of apples by the door of my bedroom. My sister kicks my legs underneath the dining table, hard enough to bruise, and five years later, she takes me to her favorite dim sum restaurant. This house is frozen in a sheet of ice, and it is also on fire. And I know you're afraid that you'll never love someone, and you'll never be able to love yourself, but love, this I know, we are the best combination of our parents. And when you're tying your shoelaces, about to fly to your 9 to 5, I'll kiss you on the forehead and tell you that I love you. And your eyes will widen and jaw will slacken because it will be the first time anyone has said that to you. And I'll cut you fruit the way our mothers did. And in the morning at 7.30 a.m., when you've just woken up from our bedroom, I'll bring your plate of hash browns and sunny side eggs to the duvet. In child living on loving, now living knowing that we are the loveliest things. Dinner Party for One illustrates internal dialogues around anger and grief through personification. As we move through the author's mental movies, we are invited into the details of the relationships between these challenging emotions 
and the, at times, familial intimacy the author feels for them. In snapshot after snapshot, the author brings these characters to life, and in embodying them, invites us to see ourselves and our shared cultural struggles around dealing with and acknowledging strong emotions. I'm Kara Jones, and I'm from Millard South. When anger comes to visit, she knocks quietly, she comes in quietly, she doesn't visit often, and sometimes I wish she did more. I wish she'd knock a bit louder or just barge right in and say I'm here and I'm not going to be ignored. Wish she'd ask for what she wants or just take it. She knows her way around my kitchen and yet she asks to sit. She's polite and it's unsettling. I want her to pull down the curtains, throw all of the china. When anger comes to visit, I never seem to notice grief standing in her shadow. Maybe he's always been there. When grief comes to visit, he's in all of the places that I don't pay attention to. He sits at the top of my stairs. He stands next to my fridge holding his coffee and it gives him no energy. Always existing in my space, but never taking up any of his own. We talk of things that are only skin deep, the sort of shallow that makes me think that he could be Jesus. And I, well, I must be Peter, wading out into this puddle after him. It's unsettling how he laughs at all of my jokes. Grief asks me what I want for dinner. He asks where my cutting board and knife are, the plates, the silverware red eyes, but I've never seen a tear well up. When anger and grief come to visit, we have dinner, we sit, we eat. The excessive quiet seeps into my marrow, and it's unbearable, waiting for one of us to interrupt it. And here is where it happens. Anger sighs and grief looks to her, ready to share an empathetic glance, and that is what it always is with him, empathetic glances, and I can hardly stand to look at him anymore because of it, and yet he stays. So instead I look to anger, because there's always something more going on behind her face. But here is where I break. Down, apart, something in me snaps. I do anger's job for her until no china is left, grief's job too, until no tears remain, breathe. In the moment after the chaos, I wonder if anger was ever really anger and if grief was ever really grief. I wonder if anger and grief created this being we call myself. Is this not my life story? Some days it feels like it's not, but it's on those days when I am most full of them in their presence that it is undeniable. Thank you all for watching so far. There's more to come. I want to take a minute just to thank uh, everyone who's made it possible for us to really get through 2020 and keep going through 2021. We do work that we love doing with our students. We're grateful to still be in the classrooms uh, virtually. Um, but uh, and also just so feel fortunate that the artists who work for us are still working um, for us because of donors who've made it possible in, a, in an incredibly difficult year. Uh, I want to thank specifically folks like the Nebraska Arts Council in Humanities Nebraska. You've really done a lot this year for us and other arts nonprofits. Thank you. Um, Target and Microsoft, the Sherwood Foundation, who's helped us since practically the beginning the State of Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services. Thanks, Nebraska. Uh, the Tom and Mary Jatan Charitable Fund, the Literary Arts Emergency Fund, Warren Distribution, Tina and Dan Lonergan, Mid-America Arts Alliance, the Cooper Foundation, the Woods Charitable Fund. You've both done so much for us in Lincoln. Omaha Community Foundation, Douglas County has done so much for us this year. Uh, the Somer Family, Roger White's, the Diabetes Care Foundation helped us this year. Uh, Nancy and Mike McCarthy, Betiana and Todd Simon, the Whites Family Foundation, Katie Whites, Susan and Mike Liebens, and the Logier Foundation, Hyder Family Foundation, Kiewit Foundation, 
and Paul and Annette Smith, who have been with us since the very beginning of Louder Than a Bomb. Thank you all, and thank you everyone who's given just a couple dollars to us. You can donate online at our website, anywriters.org slash donate. Thank you all. Crooked Eyes, Fat Bodies, Broken Hearts is a poem within a poem. It first tells a story of self-love and of hard-earned confidence. Then, as the author delves deeper, the first story breaks open and is replaced by another truth. Yes, this is still a poem about self-love and about having to find that on your own and in your own way. At the same time, this second poem is also a critique of a society that expects some people to have to overcome something about themselves to find happiness or to fit in. As that second poem unfurls, the author reframes the development of the poem as their own development and their empowerment as a process of first trying to fit into someone else's box and then finally acknowledging the need to abandon that box and move on. And so, instead of overcoming, the text turns to self-acceptance, both for the author and for the poem itself. Um, hi, my name is Trinity Johnson and I'm a junior from Westside High School and this is my poem, Crooked Eyes, Fat Bodies, and Broken Hearts. It's September 28th at 6.32 p.m. and I'm sitting and scrolling through my mom's Facebook. It's homecoming and I'm happy. A girl wore dresses, are a foreign language, content with her friends and feeling just fine, but it wasn't always this way. Growing up, I compensated my sadness by eating, playing sports, then feeding myself. In the third grade, I was last running the pacer test and second for teens. I never saw a problem by the sixth grade. My weight was a target. And the kill yourself comments, arrows shot by fake friends who loved and hated me. I remember one day in gym class, I was picked last and was the only girl on the all boys team. Condolences to your self-esteem. Let your future be in agony. Learn that you don't sit without sucking in your stomach. Learn that a fat person's place is in baggy clothes in the back of the class. It's homecoming night. I walk around and ask everyone if they noticed. Shrug shoulders, a declaration of my foolishness. Of course they did. Big eye, big lazy eyed girl, big crooked face, lazy eyed girls. Don't cry girl. How am I not supposed to cry? I see myself as an abomination. Cyclops got nothing on me. My face a non-symmetrical oval, my eye crooked due to its laziness, due for a surgery, the only way to make me happy. I watch my 600 pound life like the gospel, praising the knives, digging into the skin of the sinful, praying for a sense of security. I cried at homecoming. I cried using the eye that made me want to die, made me hate myself more. I walked out of that dance tripping over my words, my confidence stuttering. I can never talk about my body without joking, choking on other false narratives now. When I originally wrote this poem, I wrote it with a happy ending, as if self-acceptancy is gained through stanzas and rhythm. The easiest jokes to make are about my body. Fat people are the funniest. It's the same thing as saying they're laughing with you instead of at you. My existence, a comedy show for the wicked. And yet they tell me to love myself. How dare when my body is perceived as a killer, as if obesity defines me a word I don't even fit in. I'm so sick and tired of compensated for just being me because fat bodies are just bodies and crooked eyes still see. And I'm here living proof that you have a chance. I'm here breathing, loving, laughing in this body, in this body I am here. Choking on my own narratives because this is my body and my body alone. Real Feminists Don't Cry puts the ideas of identity and self-awareness on display with lyrical flourish and narrative savvy. The poem is at times funny while still being heartfelt. It is well-crafted and clear-eyed from the first words. As the author fleshes out her torn feminist speaker, we move into a metaphor and image-laden exploration of positive self-talk and the struggle to admit that pain is real even if we are not proud of the reasons for it. This is called Real Feminists Don't Cry. 
In a perfect world, I wouldn't feel like I am single-handedly dismantling the entire feminist movement by crying over a boy I liked. As hot salt dries into my cheeks, I am ashamed, because this isn't who I'm supposed to be. Stupid, sensitive, and surprised. Surprised my first boyfriend wasn't the one. Surprised that 16-year-olds are not exceptionally mature human beings. Surprised at the immense hypocrite I've transformed into in a matter of months. The girl religiously chanting yes means yes, who can't ever say no. Radical women's rights activist one day, walking wrung out washcloth the next. A fraudulent feminist who can't practice what she preaches. This is not who I'm supposed to be. But strong, independent women do not cry. Liberated 21st century women do not get their hearts broken. Rational, self-respecting women do not equate their worth with another's affection. If I were a real feminist, I would care for myself more than I still care about him. I would bottle, gift wrap, and mail to my own front door every tear I've shed over him. Smother my reflection in strawberry-scented kisses every time I wonder if a different height or weight would have changed anything. Write myself a love letter every time I want to apologize for not being good enough. If I were a real feminist, I would wear the words good enough around my throat like a diamond necklace. Sharpie them in capital letters across every mirror in my house. Tattoo them into the soft flesh of my memory. Never let them leave my tongue until I'm no longer inextricably linked to someone who was elected to stop speaking to me. Until I refuse to keep missing someone who never needed me the way I think I need him. If I were a real feminist, I would use self-love like superglue till I no longer see myself as broken, as lacking, as lost. Hold myself close and whisper, good enough, till the only love I need is my own. Nobody's gonna know. Nobody's gonna know. They're gonna know. How would they know? How would they know? How would they know? I can't. I can't. I just, I can't. Oh my god! Hey, I gotta tell you one more thing. In two weeks, on April 29th at 7 p.m. Central Time, you can join us for the virtual ceremony that celebrates the crowning of the first ever Nebraska Youth Poet Laureate. It's a pretty big deal. We're really excited to find this human who is going to be not only an amazing writer, but a great person, right? So this person is going to uh, be celebrated for their literary achievements, and they're also going to get civically engaged over the next year with mentorship from the Nebraska Writers Collective. They're gonna make a difference in their communities uh, and give back. We are so excited to tell you who this person is. Please tune in. Uh, if you need the link, if you need access, you can email info at newriters.org and we will get you set up. We can't wait to see you there. Going home is a family history, but it is also an extended metaphor. At times the language shines in its simplicity and beauty. Moments later, that same language, simple, now dazzling, as it is transformed, bringing the physical objects and images of the author's home to life until they too are the author's family. What is most undeniable and compelling about the poem is that as it tells its story of women connected, its images and metaphors are connected the same way. The poem itself is a family of metaphors, each part of a coherent movement, transforming separation and distance into home, into pain, into celebration, and finally, into family. I'm Kathy Appala, and this is my poem, Going Home, inspired by Yagiyaski's book, Homegoing. In Mame's arms, we touched palms. Palms pressing heartbeat against heartbeat, hearts beating in sync, a pulse of sisterhood. There, gone, fleeting, one night, black, 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 as if the whole sky was mourning, Nyame sketched fire. Fire blazing, fire spreading, fire burning, scars like fields, uncontrollable scars like 
cassava roots. Gnarled and thick, they wind their way through generations, separations, like small, soft hands fattened by lazy months in their mother's womb, too young to know Niame, too young to know family, to know pain, hunger, sorrow, separation. Like drum beats pounding from a doomfa to Kumasi, broken echoes of Asante heartbeat separation. Like Mame's eyes, weathered and old, like Fufu, like Banku with the life pounded out. Separation, fire coursing under skin, throbbing skin like dirt hides fire, burning, scorching, dried out and parched and starving water, swelling brings life to the dying roots like tendrils catching, twisting, pulling together. Nyame willing, fire touches water and hisses, like rain touching desert, like red coals to bare feet, like the sound of whips, for they grab and cling on naked skin as if they were babies, clinging to the backs of their mothers. Nyame willing, water touches fire and calms, pacifies, Soothes as if the fire had never known thirst and the water apathy. They dance, clouds of steam twisting and coiling like thick braids woven together by worn hands. Natural and new and special, they sing. Bases erupting as if they wish to fill the ocean with their voices alone. Altos like molasses, rich, silky, smooth sopranos carrying over as if wondering if they could soar high enough to sweep over the peaks of mountains. They laugh, they scream, they wail, they rejoice, for here, here is home. Now these, these is good. They're good. But they're not better than that power tree. Isn't that right, Gina? These are not the star of the show. You're right. Mm -hmm. You're totally right. Mm -hmm. No, put that down. Mm -hmm. You put it down. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, look. We just want to say it has been a night full of energy, spirit, poetry, and so, so, so much talent. We can't wait to be in person with you in spring. 2022 when we can really turn up the volume and make things louder than a bomb. Yes All right, y'all. Well, I hope y'all had a good time Go check out the YouTube channel and we'll catch y'all next time Bye. Bye It doesn't look that bad we look, we could see him. This is just a test. Do we need to, or do we want to stand? <laughs> I think, I don't know. What am I doing? Where's my record button? Oh, Lord. <laughs> Can y'all see my show?